Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X research and professional physicist. And today I'd like to bring to you another one of my articles. This one's entitled Enormous Planet X Central Star Close to the Sun and Why Dr. Harrington Was Killed. Now, in Article 629 entitled Planet X Plasma Ejections Explain Why Planets or Toroids and Star Connections, I show that the basic gravitational connection between stars is between their magnetic poles, and that this connection is most likely an actual physical connection made of positively charged matter or protons. In other words, there should be a proton stream between stars that connect from pole to pole, although it is also possible that the connection is simply made of photons. A star which forms after its core material is ejected from the north magnetic pole of its parent star will always have a connection to its parent's north pole, and a star ejected from its parent south pole will always have a connection to its parent south pole. And this is illustrated by this diagram where this would be the parent star, this would be the ejected star, and there's always a connection. So obviously the ejected star came out of this star's, the parent star's north pole. So there's always a connection between the two. This will be one of the poles of the ejected star. So there's a connection from pole to pole. So a parent star and ejected star will always remain connected through this basic particle mass interaction between parent and created matter, which, as I said, may be a physical plasma connection around of perhaps protons exchanged between the two, or photon connection, or possibly both. This understanding arose from the observation that Planet X system stellar cores, or the cores of stars and planets which died, in other words, they lost their gravitational energy, regained the ability to create matter and eject it from their magnetic pole regions after absorbing gravitational energy, in other words, photons inside particles, from solar system objects. And the fact that cores and their debris fields remain connected even after losing all gravitational energy. You may look at Article 618 for details on that. Celestial objects also eject material from equatorial regions, but the matter coming from this region is of much lesser density as it comes from magma layers closer to the surface. Thus, polar regions are core ejections or ejections coming from the core, and equatorial ejections or less dense magma ejections. But stellar cores are just the core and do not have enough energy to produce a magma layer. So they are only capable of core ejections. However, because of their new very low density state, the matter they are able to create is very low density as well. In other words, gaseous plasma. And this diagram illustrates how a parent star and an ejected star will remain connected, but the forces acting on each will cause the stars to remain at a certain distance to each other. So here we have a parent star and here we have an ejected star. And the parent star and the ejected star are connected and there are forces between them. There's this gravitational force uh, which is between the protons in each. So the protons in the ejected star are attracted to the protons in the parent star. This is the main gravitational attraction. Then there's the basic gravitational attraction, which is also between protons. But there's a little b to say this is the basic one. This is the fixed connection that's always there between the two. And then there's the electric interaction, and this is a repulsive. That's why the arrow points in the opposite direction, away from the parent star. And it's between the electrons in the outer layers of both stars. They will repel each other. And then there's another gravitational uh, interaction, but it's repulsive, and it's between electrons and protons, so it points this way. Then the parent star will have... Uh, um, the same forces acting on it because they're always equal and opposite forces. So whatever forces act on the ejected star due to the parent star also act on the parent star due to the ejected star.
So, but then what happens if one of the stars becomes a stellar core? And this is what happened in uh, with the solar system. The sun did not die, but the other stars around the sun did. They became stellar cores. And so what would have happened, and since the sun is quite a small star, then it would have been its parent star that would have turned into a stellar core. And when that happens, then the star lost its gravitational energy. The connection would still be there, but the other forces, the attractive force that it fell towards the sun was gone that main attraction, and the repulsive forces would also be gone. These two repulsive forces would be gone. What's left is now the fact that the core has a positive charge, and it will feel an attraction towards the sun's electrons. But this force may be quite small because the positive charge is quite small as well. Uh, A lot of the electrons would have gone in and... um, cancelled out most of the positive charge, it would still remain positively charged because they will always remain positively charged. They start out positively charged. But this force may be small also because the distance is quite large, whilst this is a fixed connection. So this is most likely the force that uh, would cause this object to follow that trajectory and move towards the sun. And this star, because it's a parent star, would have had other stars that it also ejected. And all these stars would follow the parent star towards the sun. And these stars, other stars in turn, may have been connected to the star. It depends how large it was. If it was a very large star, it may have been connected to other stars and those stars connected to other stars. So a very large system, most likely, probably the whole system around the sun, may have been connected and may have gone in behind one of these stars. So the planet X system stars were a part of a technologically advanced galactic empire where new star systems would be added as spacecraft managed to get to new stars. So that the star systems must all have been near to each other and thus connected gravitationally by the basic parent to ejected star connection. The spacecraft may even have also used the connection to navigate from one star to another. So, and you may look at Article 624 for details on that. The electrical inter- interaction attraction between the positive charge in the parent stellar core and the sun's outer electron layer may be weak, as I mentioned. So, most likely, it was this force that brought it in. This would mean that the first stellar core arriving at the sun, uh, which most likely arrived at about the time of the Great Flood or between 5,000 and 6,000 years ago, was the parent star to the sun. And a whole lot of other stars in the destroyed galactic empire and must must have therefore followed them. Since a stellar core seven times larger than the sun has been observed recently, which must have been a new arrival at the time that the image was taken, although the image may be up to 30 years older than the timestamp would have us believe. And you may look at Article 500 entitled The Sun's No Longer Shining Review for more details. The first stellar core to arrive was most likely larger than seven times the size of the Sun. And here's this one, seven times larger than the Sun. You can see it's provoking the Sun into having a strong plasma ejection. It's a CME. Uh, Plasma ejection CME is the same thing. The Sun is ejecting positively charged liquid plasma. And as a result of a matter creation event, which these objects provoke it into. And you can see the objects very close to the sun. You can see some of that plasma in front of it here. Now, once the objects have become gas giant, this is what happens to them because they go through a re-energizing process when they come to the sun and they turn into gas giants. Then they go into orbit around the sun and no longer provoke the sun into having these CMEs. You may look at Article 532, which details the re-energizing process. So the first stellar core to arrive may have been 10 to 15 or even 20 times larger than the sun. And if that is the case, or 
it may even have been larger than that. The, there's no limit, then this dead star would have become a very large gas giant following the same process that allowed Jupiter to become a part of the solar system. This initial stellar core would still be in a very close orbit around the Sun. You may look at Article 620. These objects would be eclipsing the Sun for many hours every couple of days so that it is impossible to get the view that we are shown from, uh, for example, stereo uh, core to images uh, like this one unless a manipulation of the image is done, i.e. the sun's jets are added to the image whilst what we actually see most of the time is the surface of a gas giant passing in front of the detector. You can see this uh, it's convoluted kind of shape that we can see in places there. And so whilst we so we would actually be seeing an object and this would be added to the image. And since these huge gas giants would be having plasma ejections from the region around the magnetic north poles, their presence in the inner solar system would explain what we observe in the image shown here. You can see this looks like a plasma ejection happening here and this is most likely on the surface of the object that we are actually seeing that is actually what's in front of the detector and this would most likely be close to one of its poles and uh, so this shows that we are not actually uh, looking at the Sun at least some of the time in these images even if they are much older than the time stamps. In other words they are from a time when the Sun was still shining because at the moment there is plenty of evidence to suggest that we have not seen the real Sun for over 20 years. And you may look at Article 536 entitled Was the Sun Already Not Shining by 1998 for more details. Since this huge stellar core must have come into the solar system thousands of years ago, it must have gone into orbit around the Sun as a gas giant even before Jupiter did and must therefore have been eclipsing the Sun for thousands of years. This explains why there is evidence of alien technology being in use several centuries ago in the form of sun simulators which produce sun halos because as I have shown it is impossible for ice crystals to produce sun halos. The very idea is preposterous as light can never exit different crystals in perfect alignment. It is impossible. Sun halos can thus only be produced by a large artificial lens in the Earth's atmosphere and you may look at article 545 entitled Planet X and Sun Halos Aliens Covering Up sun going dark. Now the parent star could have been connected to the sun's north or south magnetic pole. If its connection was to the sun's north pole, it would have come into the solar system from above the sun. Since Dr. Harrington was killed after taking his telescope to New Zealand and thus pointing his telescope far south of the ecliptic, it is likely that the objects come from below the ecliptic and were thus connected to the sun's south pole. Dr. Harrington must then have observed one or more of these objects, some of which are much larger than the Sun, as I said, approaching from the south. And that is most likely why he was killed. And here you see a picture of Dr. Harrington. He was chief astronomer of the U.S. Naval Observatory, and he took his 8-inch telescope to New Zealand in order to find Planet X. What he must have found led to him being killed as he developed a very fast-growing cancer of which uh, there had been no sign a few months before. And here you see some stereo HI2 images of objects which appear now and then in these images. For some reason they just do not manage to cover them up because we do know that we have enormous gas giants very close to the Sun. So this is most likely one of them. And you can see the convoluted shapes on its surface which we also saw in the Core 2 image. So this is most likely what we're looking at. This is an HI2 image, so it looks a bit further away from the Sun. Um, but we can actually estimate its size uh, from putting together HI1 images with uh, Core 2 images, where the size of the Sun is indicated by the circle. And by uh, aligning the jets coming from the Sun in these images, we can figure out how large the Sun would have to be because 
of course, it's the same detector. The, the spacecraft is the same distance from the sun. So if the sun was in this image, it would be that size. And so this is the size that it's shown here. So this I did this twice. And then by placing this image, uh, I aligned so that the width, because you don't see the top and the bottom, it's about the same size as these. And then the sun would be about this size. And you need about 20 of these to draw the diameter of this object. So this object is about 20 times larger than the sun. And it does appear here a bit further away from the sun because this is an HI2 image. And that would indicate that they um, have orbits that may be elliptical and may go quite far away from the center of the sun, perhaps about 30 times the sun's diameter. So that would be up to about 0.3 AU, still well within Mercury's orbit. Thus, the objects come in from the south with all their debris and then disperse across the solar system, going into orbit around the sun and periodically going to the sun's corona to absorb energy. The debris will also go into some orbit and some will end up in the Earth's atmosphere. We know that because we have clouds which are part of that debris. So in conclusion, there are most likely a good number of planet X system stellar cores turned gas giants that are much larger than the sun, very closely orbiting the sun, which indicates that stereo core 2 images have to be showing the surface of these objects rather than the sun a lot of the time, even if the images are from before the sun went dark, as some of these objects have been there for thousands of years. The objects also seem to be connected to the sun's south pole, and they are all thus most likely coming from south of the ecliptic. And these are the references. This is Dr. Claudia Albers, Planet X physicist. Thank you for watching.